Well, good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to you to this QNZ100 Conservation Talk and Clinic. Welcome to those who are joining us on the live stream and also who will be watching um, this event in the future. My name is Niall Zuri. I'm the Senior Project Officer with QNZ100 Memories for a New Generation, which is a State Library of Queensland commemorative program. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to welcome our special guests this morning, and I'm not sure whether we actually have them here yet, um, some of our conservators from um, Queensland Museum who will be assisting with our clinic this morning and also who have put a lot of time and effort into the videos that we will be showcasing during the morning. QNZ100 Memories for a New Generation is a five-year legacy program that the state government is running on behalf of the Queensland government, and it commemorates 100 years of ANZAC and the centenary of service. Through this project, the library has been running a series of programs, and through my regional activities, we have presented 19 of these uh, conservation talks and clinics throughout the state. So it's the opportunity now to do one in Brisbane. Through the event this morning, we'll provide some tips and tricks for preserving your own First World War collections. Um, the clinic this morning, after morning tea, there'll be hands-on advice also in relation to specific items that you will have brought with you, or at least those that are staying. <clears throat> Although First World War is the theme of our event, what you're about to hear is applicable to any heritage materials, no matter what type and what age. The talk is being live streamed to anyone who's unable to attend this morning and has the opportunity to watch this presentation. It's also being recorded so that we have a resource for the future. And that's part of what QNZ100 is about, is creating resources for the future uh, in relation to First World War. So be aware that we are recording the session. I think that's probably fairly obvious. Um, and that we will be taking some photographs during the session this morning. The format of this morning's activities will begin with a talk by Rachel Spano, our senior conservator uh, with Preservation Services at State Library of Queensland. There'll be a short time for some questions and answers. We have two roving mics, um, so please wait till a mic gets to you before you ask your question. You're then invited to partake in, in some refreshments on the Queensland Terrace. And this is where we'll be releasing our series of conservation resources. Following morning tea, there'll be a conservation clinic as well. Um, and even if you haven't brought items, you're most welcome to stay um, and listen to the advice that's being provided. So I think that's all I need to say, other than to welcome Rachel Spano. Um, and please enjoy the presentation. There are some... Um, brochures and um, things outside on the bench, so please pick those up. Um, they will be useful for you as well. So um, please welcome Rachel. Morning, everyone. Caring for Collections conservation series by State Library of Queensland in collaboration with Queensland Museum. How to care for your family collection. Family collections can provide us with a strong personal connection to our history. The first step to caring for your collection is to sort it into logical groups. Doing so will help you identify what you have and reduces the risk of misplacing items. Don't throw anything out unless you're 100% sure. Creating an I don't know box is a safer alternative. Next, create an inventory list of your collection. To add significance and value, identify people in photographs and attach stories to each item. By prioritising your collection, you can identify important and valuable items. This will help you decide what needs conservation treatment, digitisation or special housing. 
Decide what is the best or most affordable housing option for your collection. Any kind of housing is better than none. Finally, share your collection. Digital collections can easily be shared online with family and friends. And selectively displaying your collection will allow you to share your stories on significant days. By properly caring for your family history, you can ensure it will be around for future generations to enjoy. And you'll be playing your part in caring for our history. Um, I'm, as Niles introduced me, I'm Rachel Spano. I work in Preservation Services with a, another wonderful team of conservators who care for mostly the State Library's collection. But we often have opportunities to um, outreach and share our expertise with people in the public and the, what we call the distributed um, Queensland Heritage Collection, which is in people's homes and in um, historical institutions and RSL clubs. And we just want to uh, um, enjoy sharing our expertise and think this is a wonderful opportunity. So today, um, being a library and us mostly being paper conservators, um, our specialisation is in paper conservation, which is why we've called on the expertise of the Queensland Museum to help us with some of the objects and textiles, which are often in World War I collections and also in library collections. So today I'm mostly going to be talking about books and covering books and diaries, letters, certificates, documents and photographs, which are paper -based materials. Um, I'll also touch a little bit on metals and textiles as well. And as you saw, saw from the first video there, we've got a series of 10 videos, and that includes a metals and textiles one, which I'll show later, where the museum staff um, get to show their expertise and inform you. All right. So one of the biggest um, things that impact historical collections, and especially paper-based, and I brought out a selection of different types of materials that you might find in library collections, and a few of them are pertinent to World War I. Um, but one of the biggest things that deteriorates paper, because it's an organic material, is the environment that it's stored in. And so one of the best ways to preserve your collections, first off, is to try and maintain a stable environment. And down the bottom there, I've listed a few different things and I'll go through each one and I'll talk to you about some tips and tricks that you can apply at home because sometimes getting a stable environment at home is very tricky and very difficult, um, especially if you don't have air conditioning or you live in a, um, a house that you enjoy having some of the outdoor air come in. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to try and get a good um, stable um, environment. So there's two extreme examples there. One is probably a standard home with... Um, nice study. The other's the back shed. And trust me, that's where some people's collections end up, in the back shed. <coughs> um, we have had collections arrive at the library from pastoral stations where the collections, the archive collections, have been kept out in the barn for that business and that property and they have then come straight to the library and been delivered to us here. Library have them. And we're like, thank you. Um, and so we've had to deal with a whole myriad of pests and mould and issues like that. So... Down the side there are five examples of, um, that are incorporated into environment, temperature and relative humidity, light, pollution, biological agents, and handling your own um, way that you handle things. So the first one is temperature and relative humidity. The first thing that we suggest is that you avoid extremes in temperature and relative humidity. We know in Brisbane we get extremes up into the 30s, mid 30s. If you live out in um, Western Queensland, for any of any pond who's live streamed in from Western Queensland, you get up, might get up to the 40s, mid 40s, and you have quite extreme high temperatures. And you can imagine if you think of the image back before in the back in that shed, or even in a in a corrugated tin shed, um, what kind of temperatures can reach up in there in the middle of summer. And if you have a collection in there, maybe a paper-based collection or a photograph collection in there, it's going to be experiencing that really high temperature. And that destabilises the structure of um, and the integrity of the item itself because a lot of books and photographs are not just a paper. They've got layers of gelatin and glues and adhesives in books and all of those swell and expand at different rates to each other. So when the temperature and relative humidity goes really high and then goes really low again, all those things flex and change. If you think about your sleepers and timber that's out in your garden and it gets all the splits and cracks in it from weathering, 
that's rather an extreme example but that exact same swelling and contracting or even in your doors when you get a wet day and the door doesn't shut properly because the timbers expanded that also happens in books and in photographs as well and all those layers um, within it shift and change so that's why we recommend that stabilizing your temperature and relative humidity can extend the life of your collection items and f temperature and relative humidity moves in waves throughout the day so if you think of a graph with waves and if you stabilize it out then you what you're trying to do is minimize that wave so those extreme highs of temperature and lows and I'll tell you some fantastic tricks that you can do at home to try and stabilize that so know your environmental conditions I know that at JCAR and Tandy doesn't exist anymore but and neither does um, but anyway, electronic shops often sell little dials. You may even be able to get them at the National Geographic shop that show your temperature and relative humidity on a little digital readout. Um, I know I have one at home and w the room that I've got it sitting in, I walk in and I go, oh, it's a quite a warm day today and oh gosh, the humidity is quite high. And you start to learn what rooms in your house have different temperatures and relative humidities and what time of the day is often good. So we also suggest to move collections away from doors, windows and external walls. You may have a, a, a side of your house that gets the intense sun uh, on a hot summer afternoon and you might touch the wall and go, oh my gosh, that, or you might even walk into that room and go, oh my gosh, this room is really warm. Now that would definitely be a room that I don't suggest that you keep your family history collection in. Um, we often recommend that it is an a room that has internal walls with maybe a more of a shady um, exterior wall um, most of the day and maybe in even inside the cupboard that's in that room is often a bit cooler as well. We do know that Queensland homes, if you have a downstairs of a Queensland home, that the downstairs is often a lot more insulated and cooler in the summer. Um, just make sure that it is built in some Queensland homes don't have the downstairs built in and it's exposed to pests and a bit of weather. Um, so just make sure it's enclosed in, but often the downstairs of your house is a lot cooler and um, is a good environment. Move collections away from sources of heat and moisture. If you have a fireplace in central Queensland, it does get cold, Stanthorpe area, and you've got a fireplace, maybe around the fireplace is not a place to keep your family history collection or maybe even display some of your collections because the walls might get hot or there might be that, that, huge, that extreme fluctuation in temperature throughout the, the evening that can affect it. Um, we also suggest improving air circulation and ventilation and that comes into effect later on when I talk about mould where good air circulation will stop mould spores from settling and breeding. Um, it also, it's also a good idea to insulate ceilings and walls. Not only does that help you with your own coping with the summer heat but it will help your collection and things that you have in the house. Um, I think most people's houses are insulated these days anyway. Um, another factor is light. Um, both sunlight and artificial light are harmful. On the right here you'll see two photograph images that have experienced different pigments fading. Um, up the top all the yellows and greens seem to have gone and we've left with blues and reds. And down the bottom the reds and blues have gone and we've been left with green and paler yellows. I'm sure a lot of us have um, photo, photogenic, photochromogenic photographs from the 1980s that once they've been sitting out on the dresser for a while are a bit more yellow and green than what they used to be and that's just because colour pigments in that photograph have faded over time and unfortunately you can't get that colour back unless you're lucky enough to have the negative you could go get it reprinted and then you'll see the amazing difference when you compare the two and go oh my gosh look how much that has faded. <laughs> um, Light does cause fading to um, curtains <laughs> and to um, fabrics and textiles as well. But to photographs and paper, it can cause embrittlement. And embrittlement means as drying out. Uh, it, it can help accelerate the acid deterioration um, in backing boards and also in paper. It can also cause discoloration. And I don't know if anyone's seen um, matte burn on a watercolour when you take the watercolour out and you can see that it's left a burn mark. Um, we could have a look and see if Gunnar um, Boyle here has some matte burn. He does a little bit. I'm not sure if you can see, but if you have a look around here, this is where the old window mat used to sit on this photograph. And if you see around the edges here, you can see a little bit of burn there. 
and that's from the acidic mount board but light also can affect it and also can cause some fading to the photograph inside and that's why you can see that dramatic change. So sometimes when you take window mounts off watercolours and photographs it's very interesting to see how it originally looked like. And that's often when you can see that, oh gosh, it's faded. Um, light damage is cumulative and it is irreversible. So even if you take it off display and put it in the dark, it's not going to regain any colour, unfortunately. But what, what you have done there is you've started to manage its light exposure for the future and you can determine that it's not going to fade at that rate any further. So recommendations for light, um, we say to protect it from direct light, so just be mindful. It's also important, as I, we suggested in the video before, that if you can attain what's important in your collection and you can give it a priority and you know that this is really significant or this item is really valuable, you can then start to implement things like taking it off the wall and maybe getting a digital copy put up instead of the original. Um, but then if you've decided, oh, this isn't actually worth a lot, I've got multiple copies of this photograph or this is, you know, not that important, then you can leave it up on the wall. So it is very important to determine some kind of significance to your collection and importance. And don't, um, um, don't discount sentiment or value because sometimes your own sentimental value will strengthen over time. So you might think this has sentimental value, but then in 10, 20 years, it actually becomes more valuable. So if you have any sentimental attachment to anything right now, treat it as valuable and significant and give it some good TLC. Um, we also suggest cover windows with thermal um, and insulated curtains or blinds. Um, if you've got a lot of your family history collection on display, um, use UV filters and non-UV emitting light tubes. A lot of LEDs that are around now are fairly low in their UV emissions anyway. And also if you've got dimmer switches, it's often useful to put, use dimmer switches. Um, a great example I have is my mother has a wedding photograph of her and my dad um, and it has sat underneath a table lamp in the lounge room for years and years and years and years, so ever since I was a child, and still sits there because she doesn't listen to me very well. <laughs> I have told her, it will fade, it is fading, mother, it is fading, and she hasn't moved it. But her table lamp isn't, is not only very short, and the photograph is right here, so the light is like glaring on it every night. She turns that table lamp on every night. And um, then she very proudly said, well, look, I've got a gazillion copies of it here in this photo album. So, and I went, okay, all right, I'll leave it. I'll leave you to let that one fade. So that's now her sacrificial photo. So she's left it there. Dad's looking very washed out these days. <laughs> but um, that's just something to be mindful of. You might be slowly seeing your um, collections fading under table lamps and under lights in your lounge room. So when you go home, just maybe have a little look. Um, Another thing is atmospheric pollutants. This is a tricky one because it's like the silent, quiet killer, if you want to call it that. Um, oxidative gases. Now, often we think atmospheric with pollutants. We think of, you know, chimneys with clouds and smokes and CO2 and sulphur dioxide and all that. And yes, that does contribute. And we do see a lot of sculptures and that um, in Europe getting damaged by acid rain and pollutants that are in the environment. But there are pollutants at, at home and also within collections. So as I mentioned, um, Gunnar Boyle here, our photograph, um, he has had some, some um, influence of pollutants by the acidic mount board that was around it and that has polluted and affected the photograph and caused some damage. Um, so that's what we call a pollutant as well. Um, Paper and boards can become um, brittle and discoloured. Often there are people who do live in areas where there is a lot of smoke and a, little, a lot of environmental gases that are in the air, and that can cause accelerated deterioration. That's why when I talk about enclosures today, that will add an extra barrier to that collection item and protect it from those atmospheric pollutants. And also being mindful of what you store it in because you don't want the enclosure that you put your photograph or your document in to actually be the cause of further deterioration to the item. So I'll go through some things to do with that. Also particulate matter is considered a pollutant. Um, surface abrasion and staining can come from dust. 
and we did a um, conservation clinic out in Mount Isa and one of the biggest things they had was pollutants from the mines that come across and they get dust storms also out in central Queensland and also um, pollutants from smokestacks that come through the house and so they were very mindful that usually they did tell us that the mines let them know when there's going to be that issue so they can shut the room doors and you know brace themselves for the storm so there are those things that happen as well also in library collections or if you have a book collection at home or even if you have any surface at home the dust buildup is incredible and we call that an atmospheric pollutant as well when dust settles on the surfaces of things it's often a combo like you probably wouldn't want to know what is in the dust but usually it's skin it's insect eggs it's insect it's um, hair nails food particles all sorts of bits and pieces and when that settles onto a um, onto material it just builds up and then starts to eat into the paper on top so in the library collections we often find and this is a prop book so I can I'm going to handle it a fair bit but you often find books along the top here are very dark compared to the sides and the bottom which are nice and bright it's got a bit of staining on the side but usually they're a lot more stained at the top and that's because a lot of dust has settled on there and no matter how much brushing and vacuuming and cleaning you try to do it's always going to be a bit browner because it started to eat into the edge of the paper and so having a good dust um, dust free collection is helpful I'll just leave that there like that all right Moving on to biological agents. One of the biggest challenges for any of us living in the coastal areas along the Queensland coast is mould. Yay, don't we love mould? It's wonderful. Um, I lived in Canberra for many years and so mould wasn't a real problem. So when I came from work it with there, Canberra has its own issues. We'll talk about pests soon and they have their own problem with that. Coming to Queensland and learning how to deal with mould and how big an issue that is for people in their collections. Um, unfortunately, mould is present in our environment everywhere. It's every time we take a breath in, we're taking in a few mould spores. Fortunately, the mould spore count is low. Um, <laughs> but every single surface is, has some mould spores sitting on it. And what hap how it grows and how it develops is it just needs the ideal, right, perfect environment for it to grow. And sometimes it can catch you by surprise and you never know when that mould's perfect time to grow will be. We do know, though, that a high relative humidity can um, cause mould growth and also having not much ventilation and heat. So mould doesn't like to be disturbed. So it grows in those things that are in the back dark of the cupboard that you haven't looked at for ages and then you bring them out and go, oh, my gosh, what's happened? Because they don't like being disturbed. As soon as you disturb them and you start or you're working around that particular collection all the time, the chances of mould settling and growing is very low. So one of our recommendations is to keep the relative humidity below 60%. Um, keep the storage area and your or your display area clean and dry with good air circulation. Fans is great. Um, even having it in a room that has a lot of activity. It's always a catch-22 because you're always like, well, if it's in a room that's got a lot of activity in it, then that means it's exposed to more of this. But then if I put it away in a dark cupboard, it's nice and safe. Well, yes, you can put it away in a dark, nice cupboard, but you need to check it regularly. You need to make sure that you're looking at it, that you're checking that the mould isn't growing, that it's still dry and it's still okay. So that's for the next point, regular checks, especially, especially if you go through like a week or a period of really wet weather. And attend to outbreaks immediately if you see that. And we have a fantastic information guide which you'll be able to um, grab up on the Queensland Terrace when we do the clinic about how to deal with a mould growth outbreak. So if you are worried that that might happen to your collection, grab that handout. It might be your um, go-to. Um, the other lovely one is pests. Um, insects and rodents are attracted to paper, photographs and textile collections. Because they are cellulose based, it is a food source to them. They do become picky. It's very interesting when you look at a book or a paper item, which bits of it they like to eat and which ones they don't. I know silverfish are particularly picky with their diet. They do love to graze across the top of books though. In, often you see them, they munch across the top of a book 
like a cow, they like graze across the top. <laughs> um, and also that's got, I think, probably some book lice issues in that, in that book up there. They're also attracted to areas of particularly textiles and paper where there's staining. So if, particularly if you've got a textile outfit, they like areas where something's been spilt, some food product or a perspiration, so in the armpits or in the groin area if you've got trousers. So it is often very good to clean your textile collection. So if you've got a particularly special dress or a particularly special outfit, it is good to go find a really good dry cleaner or a textile conservator and get that um, item cleaned. Because if you don't and all the stains and perspiration stay there, over time in those areas it'll break down the fibres, any perspiration that's left on the fabrics will start to eat away in that area and also is a great attractant for pests to that space. So one thing we for recommending to keep pests away is to check your collections. Um, don't have eating or drinking in the area. It's best not to keep your family collection in the kitchen because usually that's where there's a lot of pests. Um, good cleaning and housekeeping. I've, I've got down there um, to implement an integrated pest management program. Sounds fancy, but in actual fact, it's just using a series of um, pest traps around your, um, around your house. And often that can give you an indication of what pests you have in your house and what, <clears throat> what problems you might have. They're also out on the, um, when you go to do the um, conservation clinic after, we have a housekeeping checklist. And that way it has on it continuous or daily, weekly, monthly, annually, every five to ten years. It's just got a little few tips and things on what to check in your house or what to check with your collection that you might find useful. And if you're really cool and into the pests, there's a trap log on the back. So you can seasonally see what bugs might be. We do this here at the library. We've got 200 to 300 pest traps around the library here. And we have staff who go around monthly and they count up how many cockroaches, silverfish, ants, whatever it might be. Um, safe to say, it's all under control. Usually everything's fine. Um, we often have the stray fly that comes in or the stray thing, but it's never really an outbreak. It's just, oh yeah. But it's good to keep on top of it because you never know when you'll have an outbreak and you don't want a secret silent thing happening somewhere in some kitchen um, and it's usually because there's a seal broken or something. So you, you might find those handy and useful. It's got some over there. All right. One other very important thing is um, handling methods and that's the way you handle and the way that you treat your collection. And often that's very important, especially if you've got a kind of a, if you've got a fairly rich family history collection that you bring out to show your family, or you have a special events where you bring them out, or even if um, someone has sadly passed away and you're now bringing out all the photographs to have a look at it, it's very good and mindful to know how you're going to handle that collection. And you may have other people in your family around you, and you may want to be able to assist them in how they handle it. There is a bit of, well not controversy, but there is two camps in the glove wearing. I don't know if people are aware, but some people say you should wear gloves when you handle collections and some people say you shouldn't wear gloves when you handle collections. What is, however, very important is that you have um, clean, washed hands, no matter what. Um, sometimes collection material can be very clumsy to handle or turn. It's very brittle, it's very fragile. And you can actually cause more damage by having gloves on than you would if you don't. So sometimes it's better just to have glove, have washed hands. Um, some of us perspire a bit more and have oilier hands than others. If you do, just make sure you wash them a bit more regularly. I have heard that the going time for washing your hands is every 15 minutes, if, you, if anyone's taking notes and wants to know. Um, every 15 minutes when you're handling a collection, you should go wash your hands and come back. Of course, if the collection's dirty, you might want to wash it a bit more regularly. But um, I've got two different types of gloves here. I've got nitrile um, gloves. You can also use just standard food handling gloves as long as they don't have powder because um, you don't want to get powder on your collection. Um, or, or also just white cotton gloves. And these are all available at Woolworths, Coles, whatever. It's often handy to have. I know with my family history collection, I've got a couple of pairs of gloves in the box. So if anyone wants to look at it, there's gloves available. Always wear gloves. And this is a point that we 
sort of a bit more, yes, you should wear gloves even if you have washed your hands, for metals, photographs and textiles. That's because you don't actually know what you're leaving behind and the, the number of times we've seen people's fingerprint stains on these kinds of collections is um, far too many to. <laughs> it just is more, these um, collection items are more susceptible to damage from handling. Especially metals, because you often see fingerprints and you can see stains and it causes corrosion over time and you might not see that immediately. Um, photographs have a gelatin layer on the top and it, even the warmth of your hand can soften that gelatin and make it sticky and tacky. So we always recommend that you wear gloves when you're handling photographs. And also the same with textiles as well, because they are a bit more vulnerable. We suggest using support boards or boxes to carry collection material and I will talk, um, go into a lot more depth about the types of housing material because housing material can protect collections so much from all of, pretty much all of the things that I've spoken about to do with environmental and keeping a stable environment. Um, a box or an enclosure can help address a lot of those things. Um, use both hands to support material and don't carry heavy items, get a friend or find a trolley if you can. Um, this is a glass plate um, portrait which unfortunately got broken. Um, this got broken because somebody didn't actually know that it was in the box and they just dropped the box thinking that it was books and thought, oh, it's just books, but this plate was on the bottom. So it's often good to know what's inside a box and write on the front, caution glass, or there's a glass plate in here, or make sure that that item is packaged properly inside the box, maybe on top of all the books, not on the bottom of all the books. Um, and also handling books with two hands um, and turning the pages uh, gently. Um, often if you're showing your family or you're showing other people a collection, if you've got a much larger collection that you share and um, you help other people to research, um, it is good that if you come to, with, to the collection item with some respect and with your own handling, they will follow suit as well. So if something is significant and rare, make sure that you say, okay, this item is significant and rare and it's really precious and treat it like that. And you'll often find that you're giving it the right amount of space, you're giving it a pillow, you're giving it some ah, treatment, pretending it's wonderful. And then everyone else who uses that collection will then treat it the same way. So often that's a good way to approach um, care and handling. Um, here's some, a classic example of um, thumbprint stains on collection, especially photographs and how leave grubby marks. I have seen a book with a whole handprint left in it with the, the, you can see all the veins and they must have had very dirty hands. I actually think the person used it as a hand, uh, like a marker. So they, it was quite a large bound book and they used to put their hand in there and were flicking at this end and who knows how long they had their hand in there, but then when they took it out and closed the book up, years and years and years later, they left their whole hand print in the book. So they should have worn a glove for that one. Um, also on the right here is a photograph that's actually had bulldog clip. These are bulldog clip marks. And so bulldog clips are not of this era. So that would have someone put bulldog clips on it later for some reason. Um, so just be mindful of using metal fasteners and sticky tape. Um, and writing in pen. We often suggest for people to write in pencil instead on the back, in graphite. Um, that way it's reversible and it also doesn't um, cause um, irreversible staining. A metal fasteners, fasteners, metal fasteners like paper clips and bulldog clips, they rust as well over time, which can cause problems. There is a correct way to take a book off the shelf and an incorrect way to take a book off the shelf. Um, if you can tell if you've got a really good book collection by how many head caps and where that um, the picture was demonstrating the pulling of the head cap, which is at the top of the book, you can state a good library by how many head caps have been torn or not at the top by people pulling on the, or how popular a book is, might be a good thing. Um, but we do recommend and we teach our own staff here when they're taking books off the shelf to bring to clients to um, pull books by the centre of the spine and not by the head cap at the top. Digitisation. Has anyone braved trying to digitise their collection yet? You have? Well done. <laughs> Yay for you. We have a video too. Um, so if anyone's interested in seeing one of, in our series, we do have a video on digitisation and also we're going to have a new info guide out too soon. So people, that will be helpful for people as well. 
So digitizing your collection is a great way to assist in sharing it. It's a great way to share photographs with your family. It's also a great way to preserve them as well and um, have multiple copies available. Um, it also can help reduce handling the originals. So you don't have to always bring out the original item to show people, you can show them a digital copy instead. Or flick the pages of the Fragile Diary. If you've digitised every page, you can then do transcripts from that or you can um, read through it from the digital copy. We definitely recommend not to destroy the original objects after you've digitised it. Some people feel that now that I've digitised it, I don't need to worry about the original. Trust me, some people do. Anyway, so we do say that once you've digitised them, just put the original away safely and um, keep it there just in case. Ensure the duplication process doesn't harm the original object. Um, down the bottom there, very small, you can see a scanner. But sometimes scanning books can be very problematic and we do recommend that for books that you maybe go for the overhead camera option. Now look, this looks rather fancy, but it doesn't have to be that fancy. And if you look at our digitisation um, video and also the one where, yes, that was me, just doing a photo like that is just as good with a normal SLR camera or even your phone or whatever. Because you usually, there's two different ways to digitise. You can digitise for access and it doesn't matter what the size file is as long as you've got a nice clear image you can share with people. And then there's another side where you're digitising to much higher resolutions for a different purpose, more for preservation where you really want a good high quality. So there are two options of how you digitise. Um, if scanning or photocopying an object, only copy once as light damage can occur. So try not to digitise it multiple times to give to somebody. Um, it is better to just do it once and then try and share that copy. Um, and make sure you protect your digital file. And um, I'm notoriously bad. As soon as I read that, I cringe because I think of mobile phones with everyone's photographs that they take and I'm bad at it. I'm, at least I'm uploading them to the cloud now. I wasn't. They were still sitting on my phone. So if I lost my phone, I would have been crying a thousand tears from all the photos that I would have lost of my family and events. So just make sure that whatever you're capturing your treasured memories on, that you have backed them up and you keep upgrading and you share and you distribute it. So now I know I need to not have them just on the cloud. I need to have them on a drive as well. Make sure I keep them as well, keep them safe somewhere and maybe give some to my mum and my dad and my sister and share them around so that if something does happen, I don't, haven't lost them. We also recommend that as a disaster interim as well so that in case you lose all your own computer at home, it's, so just in case you have a house fire or a flood and you lose your computer, you've actually got those, those files somewhere else that you can download and pull. So just make sure that you keep that in mind. Disaster planning. Disaster planning and preparation is important, even if you um, may not be in a flood zoned area or an area that will have a fire. It is good to have a plan. Sometimes the plan is, is that you just have your family collection and your important papers in one box, ready to go at any given moment. And you know where it is and that you've got it on the list as the first thing that you can get to, to take with you, if you have that opportunity. If you don't, digitization is a good option if you want another secondary backup plan that you've got all your documents and you've got all your photographs digitised and on a drive somewhere that's not in your house or up in the cloud. Um, otherwise, just having your collection in a box ready to go um, is another great plan. Um, it should incorporate some preventive measures and recovery steps. If you're in charge of a much larger collection, it is might be good to start looking at a disaster plan, a, a bit more of a larger um, idea. There is a template on our website if anyone's looking for a template on how to do the disaster plan. We've also got information, again we've got information guides outside that particularly talk about disaster planning that you can grab if that's something that you want to delve into a bit more. One important point we want to say that it, after a disaster all is not lost. Most material is salvageable, don't throw anything out. We've often seen on television when people have gone through floods or fires they're sadly sitting at the skip throwing all their family photographs into the rubbish tip because they're covered in mud. And we're screaming at them going, what are you doing? Stop, 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 stop. They're not for the skip. They are salvageable. Don't throw anything out. You can contact us at State Library. We've got information guides. We've even got two videos on how to deal with a disaster and salvage your collections. 
and you can do it yourself it's not impossible you can also get a conservator to give you some advice as well we are available to do that so if you are helping anyone who goes through a disaster if you can tell them one thing tell them don't throw any of their photographs or family history out um, storage furniture um, the wooden, t wooden timber is it's a bit debatable. Older wooden timber is okay to use. But we do know that wood is acidic and it can transfer to collections. If you've got collection material like those books just sitting straight on that shelving, there would be acid transfer going across. It may have a varnish on it and you have to be careful of varnishes and coatings as well because sometimes over time they go sticky. Um, laminated bench tops, like I think this table here has a bit of laminate on top, is usually okay because the laminate is protecting it. The timber inside a lot of these kind of benches and trestle tables and things um, have a, a more of a particle board that's got formaldehyde in it and it's the formaldehyde that's really acidic and can transfer to collection items. But once it's got a laminate or a really good paint coating over the top, it has sealed that in and is, is pretty safe. Um, we do re highly recommend though powder coated metal shelving and units. Glass is also good, glass shelving. Um, and just be mindful, if you've got cabinets that close up, like I know I've got a bookcase at home that the doors close on. If you open it up and you smell not nice smells, like very acidic smells, very gassy smells, um, take that as a warning sign that there's some pollutants in there that need to be off-gassed. You, you can reduce that by leaving the doors open and hopefully over time those chemical smells will go away. That, those chemical smells come from the manufacturing process of the furniture. So if you're buying new furniture, just be very mindful that they can off-gas some of those pollutants which can cause issues. Okay, moving on to storage enclosures. Now, a lot of the storage enclosures that are available for um, collections are either plastic or paper. So I've got a couple of examples here of like cardboard and paper enclosures and plastic enclosures and plastic folders. You can even get plastic boxes. So add whatever you can get in cardboard, you can usually always get in plastic as well. And not either one is better or worse than the other. They just have different properties and it depends on the use of your collection and how you store your collection, which you think is the best option for you. So, this is a list, don't feel too bombarded, <laughs> of plastic products. So I'll talk a bit, I'll start talking about plastic products. Plastics are um, ideal because they're robust. They are also clear most of the time, especially the thin like sleeve ones, not that one because they're the bad ones. I'll show you the good ones. So clear plastic enclosures like this allow you to be able to see photographs and be able to see things without handling. So they create an amazing and fantastic protection. Um, this is a series of different types of plastics um, and whether they're good or not. So most of the plastics that you are available now on the market are okay. Um, they may not be the best in quality, but they are usually okay. In the past, we used to have yucky, disgusting PVC. I call it yucky and disgusting because it's all deteriorating these days. You will recognise it and probably remember if you've ever gone to a hotel room, booked a hotel at the inn, and you've gone to their information booklet and you've taken it out and all the plastic is really sticky and gooey and then you try and take the piece of paper out that's inside and the print is all stuck to it. So I'll pass these around and give them a nice feel and you'll feel how oily they are. In a few of these, you'll even be able to see the oil. Um, this one has oil, this D DVD, CD case has actually got oil collecting in the bottom of it. And that oil is actually from the plastic deteriorating. So it is itself deteriorating. Now if it had any collection material inside it, like one of them is a slide holder, had slides in it, all that oil would get stuck to the slides. All the oil would get stuck onto the paper products and makes the paper go all oily and makes the print stick to the plastic. And also the DVD, CD and DVD ended up having oil smears all over it from the plastic actually deteriorating. So that's not a good plastic and that's PVC. There's not too much of it around. There are 
some binders um, that ha still have PVC, and sometimes you can feel the plasticiness of it, and you can go, ooh, okay, I won't, I won't go near that one. So the other options are polyethylene, a combination of polyethylene and polypropylene. Now, I'll, con I'll continue. This is polyethylene plastic, which is a much more robust and solid and harder plastic. And I can pass that around and you can feel how much harder and more robust it is. So when it comes to plastic sleeves for documents and um, photographs and things like that, there are these sleeves that are around. I'm going from worst to best. So the one I'm passing around is the worst plastic sleeve. This is the next not so best plastic sleeve. Now, this plastic sleeve won't actually do anything to your collection item that's inside it. But you'll see when I pass it around how thin it is, how clumsy it is. And we have found that actually collection items that get put into these sleeves destroy the plastic sleeve especially if it's got an acidic mount board. So a photograph with any as anything in newspapers, if you put newspaper clippings in here, the newspaper, because it's acidic, actually starts to melt and burn the plastic over time. And it has happened with, it can happen even within a year. So just be mindful of that. I'll pass that around so that you can have a look. What material was that? Polyethylene. This is polyethylene. Thank you. That's a polyethylene um, plastic. They don't often write on it, but you can actually feel it. So if you go to Officeworks and you want to go through the range of all the plastic sleeves that they have, um, you can. most of the ones that they do have there are safe. There are, they are okay. Now you're just dealing with the quality and the thickness and, of what they are. So they that, there's that as well. Um... Then we start moving on to polypropylenes. There are Ziploc bags like this. Um, I send, when my kids have to take a photograph to school of them when they were a baby, I put it in a Ziploc bag. It's great for a temporary transport, temporary travel or a photograph. Um, a Ziploc bag is handy. It's a safe, it's a polypropylene plastic. Um, it can be get a bit clumsy if you're taking the photograph in and out. It might scratch it on the sleeve, there, on the Ziploc there. But the plastic bag actually won't do anything to the photograph, but it may not be a good long-term solution. It's great as a temporary short-term solution. So that's a polyethylene bag. Um, you can also get these really thin... Um, this is a mylar, which is, is a good um, polyester sleeve, and it's a bit like an oven bag, because people have said, you know, oven bags are really good to put collections in, and it's true. The only problem is, is that these can be flimsy, and they're very thin. So it probably isn't, it's a polyester plastic, and it's okay too, but it may not be the best just because it's thin and flimsy. So I'll pass that one around. Um, now we're moving on to more robust polypropylene sleeves. I'm sure everyone's familiar with these sleeves. These are Marbeg sleeves, they're available at Officeworks, um, and they are great. They are actually fantastic. They have one small problem, and I hope they change it at some point. It's these white plastic supports. They're meant to be reinforcements for the binder, if you put them in a binder. But all of the white, I don't know what it's actually made of. It's made of some other kind of plastic. But it just shatters and deteriorates, and you end up opening up a folder with white flakes going everywhere because of the white sleeve has deteriorated. And it seems to accelerate more in unstable temperatures and humidities where the sleeve is perfectly fine but this white reinforcement is just shattered. So um, just be mindful of that with those sleeves. You might just want to keep an eye on that collection but it is a great affordable option if you've got quite a large collection of documents and photographs that you need to store. Um, then the best polypropylene sleeves, we're moving on to these ones which you can get for all kinds of, you can get them for um, slides or negatives, um, photographs, you can get them just for documents. Actually, I've got one there that shows you all the different dividers and ways that you can store photograph negative collections, photograph collections, panoramas, and you know even large format photographs. So I'll pass those around as well. And those sleeves, you can get binders, fully plastic binders, 
that you can store. So this folder here has a co combination of a normal A4 sleeve for the documents, which list as we went in the first video and we saw them writing down all the information about the photographs. So this has a document at the front which shows all the information about each of the photographs and a bit of a listing and sorting info, a title for each section, and then goes through and has all the photographs in their individual little slot. So this is just an example of a very well organised and sorted um, collection of photographs and then a new start. This also, this in, once you've sorted a collection like this, then this also then helps when you need to digitise it. So, there we go. So, paper is probably most suitable for objects that are stored in a humid environment. Um, so, I don't recommend plastic enclosures if you've got a really high humid environment, but if your collection especially if it's photographs or documents and you're flicking through it all the time, that's when plastic sleeves are good. You can get around it by having these kind of folders and um, items or documents in mylar pockets then put back into um, cardboard boxes. I just realised I forgot to talk about mylar, which is the best one. My gosh, how could I have missed mylar? Man. All right, so mylar. Mylar is polyester. It is much more expensive. It's probably for your significant and your valuable collection, but it, it, it has the longest life of any of plastic products that you have. You can get it in big for maps and for posters, right down to small little ones for photographs. And it is the, one of the best, most robust um, plastics you can get. It is also one of the plastics that they use for laminating, but when they laminate, they add an adhesive as well, which is bad. So don't. We suggest not laminating. There's, yes, it's not a good, don't laminate, please don't laminate. Um, use a mylar pocket instead. So I'll pass these around and there's also an option if you um, have a quite a large collection, we suggest to people to buy mylar on a roll and if you've got a diverse range of sizes in your collection, like you've got big large maps right down to small things, you can get mylar on the roll and then sew them up on a sewing machine into pockets. So I'll pass that around as a little um, tip. Where do you buy the mylar? Yep, an audience member's just asked about Mylar pockets and where you can get them from. Um, you can get Mylar pockets from suppliers, and we've got a suppliers list in our information guide. If you need quite a lot of Mylar pockets, you can buy them through that supplier. You can also buy them from the State Library shop here downstairs. Yes, and today, if you're here, you get 10% discount today. So if you've got your collection with you, make sure you pop down and grab a few Mylar pockets. They sell them individually, but if you've got quite a large collection and you need more, you can um, buy in bulk. And we often um, suggest buying in bulk directly from the supplier as well, which are usually in Melbourne. So um, you can get buy them from the po through the post and get you, it delivered. You have, a list, you have some sort of listing you can access? Or yeah, there's a catalogue. Are you staying for the conservation yeah. clinic afterwards? Yep, I can show you where to get the Mylar pockets from. I have a question. Yep. In relation to Mylar. Do we have the mics around? Uh, yeah, we might, grab, we might grab the mics. Do you mind just holding off your question until we've got the mic? It might be easier. Um, don't let me forget to come back and get the question. Um, paper and board selection. I'll go move to the one we've got up here. So... Paper is the most suitable or board if you're storing in a humid environment or you've got collections that are really smelly. Some um, photograph negatives, if anyone's used cellulose acetate, will know that cellulose acetate deteriorates and off-gasses a vinegar smell. And often putting it into a paper um, enclosure will help absorb some of those smells and minimise that. Yet, if, yet going onto the plastic... Um, products, those smells get trapped inside as well. So, yeah, this gentleman down the front here had a question. Yeah. Thanks, John. It's just in relation to mylar and making mylar sleeves from sort of large rolls of mylar. What's your thinking in relation to double-sided tape? I have, I have made mylar sleeves using double-sided tape around three edges um, and allowing a, a fair degree of gap between the tape and the object that went inside it. What's your thoughts on double-sided tape? 
Um, double sided tape has been used in the past and is a good is a good option. I, however, though, have seen the items that are inside the sleeves actually get stuck in the tape. So they've drifted. If you've got quite a lot of movement and room in there, the maps or the documents have actually slid towards the tape and then got stuck in the tape. And then if the tape has started to deteriorate, it's given way and the object inside has got stuck in the tape. So you just it's okay for temporary. And if you're keeping an eye on that collection, you can make sure it doesn't drift towards the tape. But um, often we don't have the resources to keep an eye on every single map in our collections. And so we just we actually just buy the mylar, but I do suggest that sewing is better if you can go that option. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. I know. Well, well, if your collection is small, then double-sided tape is still a great option because you can keep an eye on it and you can make sure it doesn't drift to the, to the side. about the acid-free glue? Acid-free glue? Um, acid-free adhesive is um, an interesting one. Depends what you're gluing. If you glue anything, you need to make sure that whatever adhesive that you're using is re reversible or in some way you can remove it. Often acid-free adhesives means that it's not going to deteriorate too quickly over time and there's it's not the adhesive itself is not going to go yellow. But if you use those adhesive, it's going to be perm still permanently stuck there unless you know that it can release with a bit of moisture or something. And so we often recommend people use photo corners instead of adhesive or glue or, or use a, if you're going to mount photographs, for example, instead of mounting the photographs with glue, putting them into a sleeve that's appropriate for the size of the photograph or use photo corners. And I've got um, an item here that has photo corners in it. Little, you can buy little photo corners even at Kmart and Woolworths and they've got sticky on them. I can show it to you afterwards because I know you're up the back and can't see uh, as clearly. But the little photo corners is probably better because it's not permanently stuck then and you can take it out when you want to. Okay, so paper objects, paper boxes are fantastic in a humid environment. It um, buffers against temperature and relative humidity. It protects it from pests. It protects it from mould. Um, if you're in a disaster, the box gets wet and then the collection item inside stays dry. We might keep the questions to the end. If the, is that okay? Yeah, is that all right? Just don't, just make sure you jump up and grab, grab a question. Um, so cardboard boxes are fantastic for that. I cannot highly recommend boxing for books, for metal collections, for um, even for putting your my, the things that you have in mylar um, into um, a box. There are um, acid-free papers and also what's called archival. There are two different types of paper products, just to confuse everybody, right? So I'll try and explain it the best I can. If I don't explain it very well and you're still totally confused, come and grab me in the conservation clinic and I'll try my best. So in the paper making process, there's two different ways that they make paper, actually three, because um, paper's made from wood pulp. About 60%, oh yeah, no 30%, 70, 30% of paper product is, has this acidic component called lignin in it when we, start, when we started making paper from trees. And so when they first started making paper, they didn't take the lignin out, it stayed in there. And a, a fantastic example of that is our newspaper print. So when you put your newspaper out on the front, lands in the front street, by the afternoon, if you haven't got to it, it's all yellow and faded and all started to deteriorate. And that's because of the lignin component in the paper. So 70% of it is roughly cellulose and 30% of it is this acidic lignin component. And it causes it to brown and yellow and deteriorate. In paper making these days, it's, we've come a long way and a lot of the paper products don't have as much of the lignin affecting the deterioration of the paper any, any further. That's not to say that the lignin it hasn't gone away. It's, in some papers, it's still there. And so that's where they've come up with this term called archival paper. So what archival paper is, is that it is the newspaper, it is the paper pulp that still has the lignin in it. So still got 30% lignin, still got... 70% cellulose, but then they chucked in a big sack of calcium hydro calcium carbonate, which is like a chalky powder and it's very alkaline, to offset the acidic lignin. 
So it's got this chalky kind of filler in it that counteracts the acidity. So when you put, do a pH test or you put a pH pen on it, it comes back and says that it's alkaline and it's neutral and it's fantastic. The unfortunate thing is, is that that alkaline buffer of that calcium carbonate can wear off over time and the lignin, the acidic lignin can come back in. So it's great as a short-term storage paper. Most of your photocopying paper that you buy now and you stick through your printer is all archival. It's got that calcium carbonate in it. It's not acidic and you'll notice that those papers won't deteriorate as fast as maybe documents you've got from the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, where it was still very highly um, had the lignin in it. The acid-free, on the other hand, in the manufacturing process, they've actually fully stripped the lignin out and that paper is 100% cellulose. And that's the best paper. It's very expensive, but it is the best um, archival paper. And it's usually called 100% cotton rag or 100% cellulose, alpha cellulose. It comes in different terms, but that is the best um, paper. So, that, so if you go to the shop and you see anything that says archival paper, usually it's got the calcium carbonate in it. If it specifically says acid-free, 100% cellulose, you know that that's, a really, that's the best quality. And we use both. We use archival papers and we use acid-free papers. Archival papers are more affordable. Um, if you're putting your collection into a stable temperature and re relative humidity, it's fine. So these board boxes that we use, they're not acid-free, but they're archival. They've got the calcium carbonate buffer in it, but they're still fantastic. And we think it's great because it still makes a safe, safer paper product that still is good for collections. Um, so there's that product. And there's also, you can get um, wallets and sleeves. I th actually think these ones might be, oh, I think these are buffered too. I can double check for you. Some products we do get are 100% cellulose, but you can get four flat wallets that you can store like large manuscript collections in as well. All right, I'll just keep moving along. So we've roughly talked about flat paper and I've talked about um, not laminating, so we can skip through that bit. Um, and we've talked about using polyester or mylar. Mylar is a brand name and polyester is actually the type of plastic product it is. Um, Polyester and mylar, we don't recommend for friable media, such as pastels, charcoal or graphite pencil drawings. So just be careful um, with those because mylar is static. You'll, you'll notice when you put your hand into a mylar pocket, your hairs on your hand will stand up because they've got sta it's got static in there and that will pull whatever pigment is on the surface off. However, you can use that um, static to help you if you've got a letter that is damaged you, it, it can hold all the pieces together for you. As you can see in the bottom right here, if you had a, had a document that was in a few different pieces, the actual static of the mylar can help hold it together without having to do any repairs. So um, don't, oh, when it comes to books and bound um, volumes, we highly recommend boxing them. Keeps that dust off the top too on the bookshelf and also keeps pests out, the silverfish can't get to it. But you do need to check, because the silverfish do love the corrugations in the board, so um, it is good to still check that. Um, down the bottom there, I've got a book that's on a pillow. Um, we recommend using pillows and supports to just to support the binding. You can see in that book just how it's supporting the binding there. Um, okay, photographs. Um, I think one of the best ways to store photographs is in the album that I showed down the front there. Um, we also recommend that you choose materials that have passed the photograph activity test. The um, National Archives of Australia have on their website um, a whole list of materials that they have tested and made sure that they're safe for storing photographs. Um, I can run through that website with people in the conservation clinic after if you're particularly interested in that. Um, the safest plastics for photographs are polyester and polypropylene sleeves, which we've passed around. Um, don't laminate photo photographs. Um, use them in the um, boards. Also, the safest papers and boards is generally acid-free in preference over archival. All right. So, also another quick point, digital photo prints. Sometimes these are like 
We do recommend, if you are going to get your photos printed and doing digital printouts, we do recommend that you pick pigment-based dyes over um, pigment-based inks over dye-based inks. A lot of the photographs that you get done through Big W, Kmart, you know, those instant digital print ones, the colours in there fade very fast. So don't expect them to have a very long life. Expect them to be a temporary, temporary storage option, a temporary display copy, and that in a couple of years' time you'll have to go get that printed again because the colours are really, like, they just fade like there's no tomorrow. So just be mindful of that. And often the quality when you get them back, you're like, oh, that's interesting colours. I often find that, but then I'm like, oh, that's okay. I'll stick it on the fridge in the kitchen and make sure I keep my digital copy. Don't get rid of my digital copy because then in a couple of years' time, if it's a favourite photo, I can just go get it printed again. So just be mindful of that. <clears throat> if you do want to get a really good preservation copy, a really good copy of a print, I suggest you go to a proper photograph shop and you actually chat with them and make sure you pick the right paper with the right ink, like a good archival paper with a good um, pigment-based ink that has lo a long life and won't fade. And just clearly ask for that. Um, also, some digital prints are sensitive to moisture, so just be careful of that. All right, now I'm going to show a video on that. Caring for Collections, a conservation series by State Library of Queensland in collaboration with Queensland Museum. How to care for metals. Metal may seem tough, but without proper care, tarnish, discoloration and corrosion can damage your collection beyond repair. Correct handling will help avoid oil and acid from your hands causing corrosion and pitting. Keeping metal in your collection dirt and dust free will reduce moisture buildup and the risk of surface damage. Avoid harsh cleaning products or over polishing. A soft brush and vacuum works best. All metal items need to be kept in a stable environment with the appropriate humidity levels for the metal. The colour of the metal and any existing corrosion will help you identify the type of metal you are working with and the steps you need to take to care for it. By using correct handling techniques, appropriate cleaning methods and keeping an eye on metal in your collection, you can play your part in caring for our history. I apologise, that started rather quickly for me. We moved on to metals. <laughs> we can come back and chat about some of the enclosures when we do the Q&A again. But when it comes to metals as well, a lot of the principles are still the same. A lot of things we find with metals is that when they're stored and put into boxes, that they rub against each other. So if you make sure you wrap them in tissue or wrap them in um, plastic, um, sometimes some people put um, metals in that, those plastic. Has anyone got the Ziploc bag? One? You know, like a Ziploc bag. Um, some people store their metal, different metals in that, just so that they don't brush and um, abrade against each other, because we often see metals can scratch each other when they're all together in one pile. So from the video, make sure you wear cotton gloves when you're handling your collection. We highly recommend storing them in acid-free boxes with a protective packaging to avoid abrasion. Um, wrap individual items in acid-free tissue, like little small components, and avoid cleaning only if necessary. Like I know some military medals do need to be cleaned for ceremonial purposes or when you're going on Anzac Day. So just, and but just do it with a soft polishing cloth or with a brush. Don't use any of those chemicals that um, we showed in the video. And that is because a lot of those um, chemicals get caught in the intricate parts of the mess and you can't really clean them out properly. And when they sit in there, they then start causing corrosion. So the next video I'm going to show is on textiles. Caring for Collections, a conservation series by State Library of Queensland in collaboration with Queensland Museum. How to care for textiles. Textiles will naturally degrade over time. However, there are things you can do to slow the process down. If you are required to handle your textiles, wear gloves and ensure the whole item is supported. 
A sheet of clean, acid-free cardboard under your fragile textile will provide additional support and reduce stress and tearing. Not all textiles can be stored in the same way, so it's important to choose the appropriate storage method for the textile. When selecting a location for storage or display, choose a dimly lit space with a consistent temperature and humidity. Dust and insects are particularly damaging to textiles. A regular cleaning schedule keeps harmful dust, mould and insects at bay. Whilst displaying your textiles is rewarding, it does pose risks. These can be reduced by using appropriate display methods and rotating your textiles on and off display. With the right storage, correct handling and good housekeeping, you can prolong the life of your textiles and play your part in caring for our history. So, when it comes to textiles, and yes, we did have the privilege of having a lovely nurse's uniform at one of our conservation clinics we did out regionally out at Bar Cal was that Bar Calden? Bar Calden. Um, so that was really lovely to have a, um, a nurse's uniform come to the conservation clinic. So, as mentioned in the video, always use a support to carry textiles when they're fragile. Um, store flat and minimise as many folds as you can because it's in the fold area is where you get a lot of deterioration and um, that. And using roll tissue to avoid sharp folds. Um, as I mentioned before, clean textiles so that they're not so attracted to insects and pests. Um, if you do have a pest infestation or pest issues on your textile collection, you can freeze it. And we do have an information guide on how to freeze collections for disaster salvage as well as for dealing with pests. Um, use a vacuum cleaner on gentle suction to clean off any sur surface dirt. And as you saw in the closing part of that video, make sure you store your collection in acid-free archival boxes and you check it regularly. Make sure that it doesn't have any pests coming in. So, um, how we can help you? We'll move into um, a few questions and answers now, but we do regularly have conservation clinics on. So, if you really in go back and you really enjoy today, I hope you did, and I hope you enjoy the conservation clinic afterwards as well. Um, you can come back and visit us. On the 7th of June, we have um, another conservation clinic session. We do it a bit differently. In that one, you'll get a one-on-one -on -one 15... You can book a one-on-one 15-minute -on -one session with a conservator to particularly focus on some more parts of your collection, if you like. Or if you didn't bring something today and you'd like to another time, you can call that number and book a spot. We also do online inquiries too, so you can email us, you can send us photographs, and we can respond to your inquiries that way as well. Um, and it's Ask Us on our website. So if you go to the State Library's website and you go to Ask Us and you press on it, you can put in an inquiry and it's a bit like an email and it pops up in our um, thing and we can help you. So we might move on to some of the questions. Uh, is this going to be downloadable? Well, actually, what I've got there is a lot of... Inf all the, if you grab every single information guide out there and watch all of the videos, all the information I said today is all in that. So the, the PowerPoint slide that I've given you today is basically a shortening down of all of those information guides. So you'll probably find all the information you need in the information guides and also on the videos as well and probably more than you'll ever need. <laughs> just, just handy having heard it to yeah, grab yeah, it to grab it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you give us, yeah, if you give me your email address, I can Perfect. do that. So afterwards in the clinic, I'll jot that down and we'll do that. Yep. Uh, um, do you want to just wait for the microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm coming at this from a scrapbooking pers perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm a creative memories consultant. So... We provide buffered, lignin-free and acid-free paper in our product. My question is, I have a goodly size World War I collection from my mum, which I have just inherited. And my query is, how safe is it for me to mount those photos using CM lignin-free, acid-free buffered mm. tape, which is what they provide along with their paper. Um, and they, they also store their 
um, their scrapbooking pages are stored in little sleeves as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how that marries in with what with what I'm saying. Us. Well, when we we did run a few years ago, we ran a series of on doing um, scrapbooking for collections. And one of the strongest things that we recommend is for people not to scrapbook with their original photographs. Make sure you scrapbook with a digital copy. And then that way, you can go to town. You can do whatever you like. You can use whatever you like. But with the original photographs and the original um, memorabilia, that you store that away safely in the plastic enclosures and the sleeves, and that you just scrapbook with an original copy. That way it gets around all those kind of difficulties of what should I use, what shouldn't I use. And if you scrapbook with a digital copy, and you can get really good quality digital copies that look just like the original, and no one would even know that it's a copy. Someone, one of the people that came to a class of mine recently um, asked me if it was a good idea to scan in their photos, which you've already mentioned, mm -hmm. and then instead of scrapbooking them, upload them into a photo book, into mm. a photo album book that they can get printed off somewhere else. Um, and I said, that's probably a really good thing, but now I know about the yeah. only scanning it in once. Yeah. It makes more sense. Yeah. It certainly does. Once you've got it in an electronic copy, you can then use that as, as you like. You can make a photo book and you can, you know, print, get prints and, and frame them and give them to everyone in your family. Especially, And also even if you've got little photos, you can blow them up and make them bigger. You can get more detail out of that um, and you can be as creative as you like and then you don't have to worry that that's, you've done something to the original and that's the only copy you've got and now I've stuck it with the wrong glue and oh my god what have I done so it is safer to just yeah do all that with a scan copy yep yeah uh, does your do your handouts include lists of um, known photograph restorers because I've had items which I really cared about um, to be like really stuffed up um, not by necessarily uh, this was a ship's model but um, somebody who purported to say they knew what they were doing but they didn't yeah um, so do you have in your list sort of a reference guide to where I can find a photographer that meets what you would consider a professional criteria rather than ones that just advertise they can do it yeah absolutely and we often um, recommend people go to the AICCM website which is the Australian Institute for conservation of cultural material. And um, on that website, they have a list of conservators in private practice who do photograph conservation, book and, um, and um, they do conservation work on all, all of this type of collection material. And we've also got some recommended places where we go to get things digitised as well. So are you staying around for the conservation clinic yes, afterwards? Ma yep, so I can help you with that information there. And I can give you all the information about AICCM as well. Thank and you. That. So we might wrap the questions up now, one more, yep, last one, and then we can do all the questions in the conservation clinic um, after. So you would always recommend to use the archival cardboard boxes rather than a plastic box? Um, I, I would in Queensland in our humidity. The only thing is, I, I say that though, but then I, at home I've got my stuff in a plastic tub, but I don't have the lid on it um, because we do find, you know, like the Clark, um, the plastic tubs that you get with the lid on them, there's no ventilation in there. And so if you put that into a really humid environment, you've got a really high chance of mould growing inside that box. Um, I have tried inside my box to put a lot more cardboard and paper material in there because the paper and the material will absorb the moisture and keep the humidity a bit more stable. And I don't put the lid on. I've got it sitting in the cupboard with a cardboard lid on top to just give some ventilation. Um, so you just have to be careful with plastic. It is robust. It's great for transporting. If you were transporting your collection, I would say go plastic all the way because it's more robust, it's more um, durable. But then if you were going to take those plastic tubs and then put them into a container ship for a long period of time for storage, who knows what's happening inside those plastic boxes while you're not there attending to it. So, just yeah. Just one other question. It might be better for the clinic, but... You know those old 1980s type photograph albums where they sort of stuck them in and put a clear sheet on top? How do you get them out to better preserve them? Um, that's a tricky one. Sometimes you're lucky enough that they're already starting to fall out 
and you've got them where they've gone through, because st um, sticky adhesives go through a period of going really, really sticky, and then they just lose all their stickiness and everything falls out. It's the, nature, the, the steps of deterioration. Usually when it's fresh and it's through the sticky stage is when it's the hardest to get on. Sometimes you can get under a bit of slip with a butter knife underneath and you can very slowly and very gently peel them off. I can go into a bit more detail in the conservation clinic, but um, yeah, it's often good to let them all just fall out eventually. <laughs> um, we'll keep the questions until the end in the conservation clinic, if that's okay. Thank you. I'll just pass back over to Niles. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and I think that deserves an enormous round of applause. <laughs> Um, as you've heard, Rachel has a vast knowledge about how to look after collections um, and she has shared very freely with us this morning um, some of that information. Who knew there was so much to know about paper and plastic, eh? Um, Rachel has referred to us, um, referred to a number of conservation guides. Um, there's a listing of them available out on the table um, and there's more of them available when we go out onto the terrace uh, for morning tea. Um, the uh, videos that you've seen this morning will also be available, oh, they are available on our website um, and Rachel's just showing point. us where they are. Um, yes. There are 10 of them all together covering different aspects of caring for collections um, and they match up with printed guides which will give you more information um, about how to do that. Um, I'd actually like to be the first to congratulate Rachel and her wonderful team in producing these videos. Um, they are a brilliant resource um, and they will make a terrific addition to the information that we have available. Um, so thank you so much and th th they'll be greatly used.